I'm Kamal Kokai. I'm a physician and I've been in holistic primary care for over 30 years now. And throughout my career, I've always been um, in some ways plagued by the question, how is it that I can be trained as a physician, someone else is trained as an acupuncturist, someone else is trained as a naturopathic doctor, someone else is trained as a, as a chiropractor, and yet these all seem to have a different understanding of how the body works. And indeed, there's acrimony in many cases of doc doctors toward chiropractors and so on and so forth. So what might be a way of actually pulling all of this together? So that's been one of the central questions um, in my practice, even though I have mastered different therapies. So my background is as, as a Yale-trained physician. I went on to do a residency, which I completed in family practice. But all along, I was studying um, homeopathy and Chinese medicine and applied kinesiology. So in particular, there's one exp there are two experiences that stand out for me um, while I was in medical school. Um, I happened to be a student on the ward taking care of a patient that had a heart attack a few days earlier. And the patient was actually, you know, he was doing well. And as a student, you know, I was required to go by his bedside and it seemed like more to keep him company since I wasn't doing too much, but I was still learning. But he said to me, I'm going to die today. And, you know, that's just, that's just the case. I said, nonsense, look, everything is fine. Residents came by, the resident came by, checked him out, he's fine. So later in the day, I went back to his bedside and he looked at me, he says, I'm going, going, gone. And he died. And maybe that's not the, the correct word to actually use, but, um, but clearly we could not revive him. And he was off on his journey. And I was really so struck by the manner in which he seemed to kind of just dissipate or actually leave his body. And that was really interesting for me. Um, and it just led to, uh, it, it made me question other things that I was already, already looking at. Um, this was around 1979. And I decided to take a year off from medical school because I didn't, and the, the practice just seemed to revolve around just the physical body managing disease. And there was really no insight as to what was actually behind that, not in terms of physiologic processes of disease, but what constitutes a human being? You know, what, what is a life energy? Are we just really just made up of matter and, and material reality? Is that it? You die and that's it? So over the years, I've had to deal with that question because as I've studied and studied other medical systems, other medical systems aren't rooted in a physical reality of the human body. There's a much larger perspective. So inspired by any number of things, I ended up writing my thesis on physics and medicine, and particularly acupuncture, which at the time, 7980, you know, William Reston, the whole thing with the reporter in China being filled, having an appendectomy with acupuncture anesthesia, that had just happened a few years before. So nobody was really, you know, they were trying to create all kinds of reasons that were appreciable to the Western mind in terms of Western physiology to really talk about how acupuncture worked. But um, they fell short on that. And as I looked at physics and I looked at the, the advancements in physics, if you go back to classical physics, um, you had people like Lavoisier, Laplace, Lavoisier um, gas exchange, Laplace like movement of planets, Harvey with circulation, and all of these things were then applied to understanding the human body, and a lot of information came up that really gave ground to, you know, allopathic or Western medicine really grew in leaps and bounds. By the same token, physics also progressed. So in the late 1800s, we have Maxwell and Faraday talking about electromagnetic fields. 
then you know we have Einstein's work we go into quantum mechanics but somehow the basic model of medicine is still in a restrictive classical physics model even though it's understood that the atom itself is 99.9% .9 space but the reality is that space isn't empty and what's in that space um, it doesn't really play itself out in medicine the way that it actually could. So in trying to um, piece things together over the years, um, at that time I was writing my thesis, there was some interesting stuff that was happening in the world of physics. There were books like The Tao of Physics by Friedhof Capra, The Dancing Wu Li Masters, that actually described the whole another level of a, a background field, a background field from which everything came, comes out of, which almost sounds metaphysical, like we're talking about the tree of life or, you know, any number of other paradigms that have been used in other cultures to explain how we go from this universal field of consciousness into physical reality. And that's, you know, um, that's something that... Um, I've explored, so I want to figure out where to start to begin to show you what I've figured out over the years. And I think the easiest place to start is with something called a double slit experiment, which is supposed to be one of the, the big experiments in, in quantum physics that actually um, um, unveils one of the big mysteries of how an electron, which is considered something that's material, Right? If you have an electron gun and you shoot it through two slits, it doesn't behave as a particle. Right? If you did that on a material level, you shot a bullet or whatever, you know, and you shot it through two slits, you would have two well-defined patterns. And on the subatomic level, if you shoot that electron out, it gives you a wave or interference pattern. Right? And you say, well, you know, what is it? Is it a particle or is it a wave? But here's the most fascinating part. Once we try to actually observe that process, even if we're trying to be sneaky and put a camera there, you know what happens? It actually becomes a particle. It functions as a particle. So what that means is that we're always collapsing the field. We can't help it. Right? There's something about human reality that tends to collapse this field. So every time we take this objective, this field that's out there, and we interface it, we collapse it. So what does that actually mean then in, in human terms? It means that our five senses, when interfacing with objective reality in terms of what's out there, we actually um, the human perception actually collapses it into what, taste, vision, hearing, touch. So we're always collapsing the field in that way. And of course we have other ways of actually perceiving, but that is not what, what medical science is grounded in. Medical science is grounded in the classical physics reality that's something that's perceived by the senses. But yet, when we go to quantum physics, we see that there is another way to describe reality in terms of a wave, right? But as soon as we focus on it, it's collapsed down. Now, one of the most interesting videos that I've seen of late is a TED Talk with a, a Dr. Jill Bolt Taylor. And talk, she's a neuroanatomist. And she describes the morning where she actually had a stroke. And she had a stroke on the left side of her brain, so that affects right-sided activities, including speech and language centers. So as she, this stroke is, is evolving, at different points, she's actually cut off from that less hemispheric way of looking at things, which is more like details, um, logical, longitudinal thought, looking at things that way sequentially. And she shifts into a total experience 
of being in the right side of her brain, so to speak. And within that experience, she feels she she describes that how the the margins of her body just seem to disappear, and she actually feels like she's a part of a much larger field where she feels connected to everything, right? That there's just this oneness and it's a euphoric feeling. And it reminded me of um, what I would hear constantly from people that have NDEs. NDEs are near-death experiences, right? And there's tons of documentation. People talk about they're going to the white light and, and how they feel. And I can tell you as having many patients that have had NDEs as my clients <clears throat> that the experience is very similar and it actually changes their life in terms of how <clears throat> they begin to just organize you know like what's really important right see what's amazed me about the west and, and western medicine and in my mind all medicine is cultural meaning all medicine comes out of a way that we define reality in the way that we actually see ourselves in reality, right? But um, so, in other cultures, the the they look at a human being as just being part of an infinite consciousness, an invisible indwelling intelligence that flows through everything. And it's interesting that her um, her experience in having a stroke actually took her back to that same reality. People that have NDEs and get disconnected then from their brain, so to speak. I mean, you have people that have been brain dead and they come back and they tell of this fantastic story of where they've been, right? Um, so that piece is just always, and I consider that as, as, as factual as I would consider penicillin meaning that this is my bias. <laughs> my bias is that we are all part of a larger conscious field that we can all participate in. And there's so many interesting examples of that. There's a book called The Source Field Connections by Brian Wilcock. And he actually talks about hypnosis, uh, hypnotizing an individual such that an individual can be hypnotized so that there's, they think that they cannot see a person in the room. Let's say they identify, you're not going to see this person for the next 30 minutes in the room. And sure enough, the person cannot see that individual in the room. But they actually take a watch and put it behind the person that the hypnotized individual can't see. And that person is able to tell time, to actually see the time that's on the face of the watch. So what does that say about consciousness and what does that say about a particular process that somehow transported that person to a different level of energy matter organization where their consciousness was non-local in terms of actually experiencing that? And again, it relates back to these other examples. So the other piece that, that stood out for me that I also consider real is past life regression. And when I say past life regression, I'm actually talking about a therapy. What I mean is that as, as individuals, as human beings, we constantly we, we cycle back to learn different lessons. For me, that's the only thing that makes sense relative to physical reality. If not, we have movies like Star Trek where we have better weapons and technology but we're still dealing with the same kind of human being with all the flaws and frailties, right? So um, as when I look at science fiction, it, it seems like technology would move us more toward um, a species of man, um, Homo sapien mechanis, <laughs> meaning at some point you'll start, you know, you'll be able to, to log in in your head to the internet or something like that which really has nothing to do with the, the connection to an infinite reality that, that is there, that under, underscores everything. 
as opposed to the idea then of homo sapien spiritualis, meaning um, a person that's actually cultivated on a whole different level. So the way medicine is practiced now, a practitioner can have skills, mechanical or technical skills, but the physician does not have to be the instrument of healing. The physician or the practitioner does not have to be someone that actually conveys the vibration that will actually help to heal somebody. And that's going to become a little clearer as I, I kind of lay out a model. So, so that's some of what um, I've actually looked at in terms of organizing that information. So then what does this mean now if we take what might, some might call a more spiritual or religious sense and apply that then to the scientific world. Well, there's something called the electromagnetic spectrum, which I'm sure I have some kind of picture of it here. And the electromagnetic spectrum talks about the frequency and wavelengths of different waves, whether we're talking about radio waves, visible light, so on and so forth. And you know, the way it's depicted, you see this wave. And I want you to consider that that wave is the same wave when we're talking about that electron that's being fired, you know, through the double slit. So the wave reality is actually the reality of the universe when we don't collapse the field. But yet in collapsing the field, we then poo-poo anything that actually occurs outside of material reality, but yet the background reality that's here is actually a wave function. So why don't we begin to look at things from that standpoint? And indeed, that's what many cultures have done.